would like to invite you to come with me on a world trip. Let's do a trip around the world. Let's not think of ourselves. Let's just think of places to visit that we could go that would be interesting. So, uh -uh. we're arriving in Hanoi, getting out of an old plane that's been at least sold three times by the Russians and filled up with so much smoke you thought the wings were on fire and you bumped all the way from Saigon to Hanoi thinking, well, have I said goodbye to everyone. Anyway, arriving in Hanoi, you get down just a few rickety steps, no one to look after you or do anything. You find your luggage thrown in a mountain of stuff in a corrugated iron shed. You find an old bus, you go into Hanoi through the roost through the rice fields. This is 1986 and I'm in Hanoi because the Australian government, bless their hearts, say we need to do something to help Vietnam. This is Vietnam where over 30 years, 30 million bombs at the rate of a million bombs a year have been dropped on this country who were never aggressive. There isn't a power station, there isn't a water station, there isn't a bridge, there isn't a post office. Um, there are 27 private cars in the whole of Hanoi, but there are 10 million bicycles, few old trucks. Um, it's quite delightful, actually. It's a quiet city, and the lights are lovely at night, and the old French Quarter's good. I meet Mr. Mun, Ong Mun and Ong Ha, and they're going to look after me while I'm in Hanoi with this money from the Australian government. They are members of the Vietnam Gardeners Association, which has 11 million members. So if you've got a garden club, you can be envious of their membership. They're in every single province in Vietnam. So they say to me, well, are we going to grow coffee? And I say, is anyone hungry? And they say, but everyone's hungry. And I say, were your parents hungry? And they say, yes. And were your grandparents hungry? Yes. It's just a fact of life. I say, do you want to stop being hungry? And they say, yes. Now, in my bag and in my head and in my hands, I've got a toolbox, fairly recent toolbox, only about 15 years old, and it's called permaculture. It enables me or has enabled me to build on my basic knowledge to create food gardens where there's low water, bad soils and almost no resources. It's enabled me to learn grafting and plants to be able to put in orchards, to keep animals healthy, to grow forests, windbreaks. I've got this particular bit of knowledge at this time in space which we hope will be useful. Over the next few weeks, Black Venus staff come in, we teach them permaculture, they go out and teach it as a new curriculum through Vietnam. So we're getting a pyramid system going. Once they're trotting along, I go to Cambodia. But I just want to tell you something about Hanoi at that moment because perhaps you've been there. When I first went there, everyone looked as if they were in the army. There were flat jackets, there was khaki, there was camela, there were hard hats. People wore gaiters, they wore belts, they often had bare feet, they only wore bits of uniforms. This is perplexing because I've been in South Africa under apartheid. Under apartheid, the soldiers are clean, smart, bright and shaven, and they carry their AK-47s. This mob didn't have any weapons at all. They were just raggled, taggled bits of army. And then I realised they had no clothes. But I could have bought a parachute on the street for a couple of dollars, and I wish I had because they were silk. Few people had silk shirts. Okay, so leaving Vietnam to get on with it, I went to Phnom Penh. In Phnom Penh, in Phnom Penh, I've never seen so many rats in my life, in real daylight. They ran across the street, they ran across your bed, they got in your rooms, they got into the food. There were rats everywhere. I got over my fear of rats. I'll just whack one now. Someone says to me, I don't like rats. I think keep them out of the house and you might have to whack one occasionally if they get too many. But rats don't faze me, but they used to always go, ooh, rats. You know, 
The other thing that was terribly, terribly bad were the dogs. Packs and packs of skinny looking dogs and if you went down a side street they'd attack you. I found out this was because they were feeding on the dead bodies. Because of all the shallow graves and all the people who'd been killed, the two million Cambodians who had died. They died of starvation, they died in the arms of their families, they'd been murdered in front of their families. Vietnamese were not so traumatised. They'd say, we won the war, we're the best soldiers in the world. The Khmer were traumatised. They'd been through and hadn't recovered from a most horrific situation. So, here we go again. We talk to the women's affairs, we talk to government departments, what would you like, and we do a trial, permaculture training course, and they send me down to Persaf in the provinces. The thing about Cambodia was different. It was as if you're in the, imagine you're in the grounds of a hospital. So many people in wooden boxes that were wheelchairs and so many people with a crutch and so many people with a rubber foot or a rubber hand or a glass eye. This wasn't just the Khmer Rouge. This was about landmines because there hadn't been, there'd been the Americans bombing Cambodia but the actual Khmer hadn't had a big civil war, not as big as Vietnam under the surface, but they did have the landmines. And it was absolutely horrific. Before you spoke to someone, you just checked their foot, you checked their eyes, or you would just check that you didn't make a mistake in asking them to carry something or do something that was wrong. In fact, while I was there, <laughs> I twisted my ankle. I remember saying, what will I do? I've twisted my ankle. And it's just like Nile. And they said, the doctor can amputate that in 15 minutes. I said, I think I'll just bandage it up. It'll be all right. I don't, don't think I'll off that. Anyway, so from there, we got them going. We got them teaching. We got them pyramid teaching. Everyone had to build a garden before they thought. You couldn't just say, I've got all this information about renovating houses and grafting and seeds and growing things. You had to do it. So once they were... You know, it was going. I went off to Afghanistan. By now, it was 2002. And I arrived in Afghanistan just as the Americans arrived to win the hearts and minds of the people. Remember? The hearts and minds of the people. We were there. The place was absolute rubble. So let's have a look now at what we're talking about. Just to recap a little. This is permaculture. This is what we can offer people even in poor resource and low resource areas. We use grey water, we use water from washing machines, we use water from washing dishes, from showers. We can grow this, we can build soils because we always start with some of these. They are bean seeds. Once we start with those, the soil's on its way, nutrition's moving in, we've got the life happening. We can create drinking water ponds which are going to be critical for the future in Southeast Asia. We can do all this. Right, now let's have a look. Here's Kabul. And I knew this other picture because I'd had 10 years in other developing countries and I knew what we could accomplish. There is no water supply. The people are just beginning to rebuild. There are no toilets. It's raw sewage. We started there and we worked with um, Maboba's Promise and again, I was living in an orphanage and starting to teach gardenings amongst my bogus promise. <sighs> we had a lot of children in that orphanage and each one had a terrible story. But the one that stays with me is the three little boys. Oh, they were just gorgeous. And we were taking each child's story and they said, after our parents died, our grandma lost us at the shop and three bad men found us and then they bought and sold us three times. So I realised under these conditions, children are bought and sold. There were 60,000 unaccompanied children on the street. Unaccompanied children, 60,000. Bigger than Bathurst or Orange. The women were using plastic bags which were starting to come into the country to get Fire's going to cook food and stay warm in damp, wet February. It was my idea of a nightmare and I sat there and I was living thinking, thank God I'm out of this. This is hell. Okay, for the next few years, I went to places of war and civil war because I was committed to, you know, having knowledge, a Quaker, a pacifist, 
taking knowledge to where people needed it most, not where they had televisions and phones and books and libraries and blah, 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 what everyone has. And then I went to East Timor and to Uganda and to Ethiopia and to Albania, which was horrific, though not a war. 2017, I ended up in Italy and it was a permaculture conference. It was just going well. Suddenly there were Syrians pouring out of Syria. The bombing had started. People were picking a suitcase and a baby and they were walking for near safety. In Bangladesh, the Rohingya were swimming rivers with their meagre clothes and their hats, baby on the head or in their arms and trying not to drown on the way. Sudan and Congo were in war. So I said to someone, hey listen, why don't we start permaculture for refugees? We don't know if it will work. Five people came to that workshop and at the end of it we started a global organisation, this is so stupid, a global organisation called Permaculture for Refugees and we had a mission statement. Now in permaculture we say start small and get it right. So we just started with our goal to transform or renovate every refugee camp in the world with 25 to 28 million people, let alone another 60 displaced, into ecological villages. We were so pleased. It had never been done and we didn't know if it could be done and we didn't know if refugees would be responsive. After war, people pick up and get on. They're responding. They want to rebuild. People who are going to be 12 to 20 years in a refugee camp, how did you take COVID? Two years locked up? How would you take 20 years in a refugee camp locked up with guns, no autonomy, nothing to do, no resources, horrible food? This has to be done. So I went, came back to Australia and I went and found my Quaker tribe and I said to them, I want some money to do this. And they said, mm, what are your outcomes? I said, don't know, it might fail. And I said, it's never been done. Maybe refugees are too scattered, too traumatised to exercise, I don't know. They said, okay, here's the money. Off to Bangladesh. We had the Bangladesh Association of Permaculture. We trained them. We trained in camps. We worked in camps. We went to Turkey. Five million refugees. 80% of women and children. Think what the earthquakes did to them. So we taught there. We went to Greece. We taught in Lesbos and in Attica. Went to Iraq, to Turkestan, where we taught. So what we found after a few years of teaching Kashmir, which is occupied, perhaps not at war, but very broken country. Okay, what we found were these sorts. Oh, we didn't find that. This is, this is roughly what people find, right? They're happy at home. They've got their palm trees. They've got their land. They're good citizens. They're contributing. They're following their culture. They're going to the mosque or the church. Their kids go to school and suddenly they end up looking back on this. They're walking away with a suitcase and a baby. Their lives will never, ever be put back together in the same way. This is what they go to. This is the Roman camp, right? Most of them have barbed wire. Many are not allowed to move. This is where you get IDPs in internally displaced people. Two million in Hanoi running away from the Taliban. This is how they live. One thing I am so glad about it's gladness beyond gladness is that I know what to do about this and I know how to do it. I know that we gradually remove those houses and build two-storey buildings, free the land for vegetables, food, collect the water. It is valuable knowledge. No, not good with electricity. This is what a camp looks like in Bangladesh. There's the health centre and you can see after a little while the plastic is a metre deep because everything comes in plastic. Every bucket, every spade, every tent all comes in plastic. And this is how we taught. We taught in barbed wire, we taught on the ground, we taught under mango trees, we taught in dark little rooms. In every case, more people wanted to come to the courses than we could take. In every case, people said, why didn't we know this before? I thought they were lousy courses because I wasn't teaching at my best with interpreters and different cultures and interruptions. They were really, you know, walking a tightrope. I'd go home at night and think, 
I'm sure I can do better than this. This isn't good enough. I want to give people the best I can and the circumstances are against me. So we thought through all these 11 camps and centres and this is what we learned. We learned the refugees live under disgusting situations, that there are rackets in camps, that women are raped. We learned that children are actually stolen out of camps. I could name the camp where the camp manager is doing it, where drugs and alcohol are introduced, where the police are corrupt. I can't think of one camp which would work well where you would feel safe. No one feels safe. You can't say, I've got to safety. You can say, I've got to a place where I can sit down. Okay. Um, so this is what we found. We found in tiny spaces people grew food. Tiny, tiny spaces. That might be the water from the washing up. They cleared the creeks, of the water supplies of oily water, and they grew fruit and vegetables. They made films. They taught each other. The NGOs who had attended every class with us, because that was a condition, when we left, they could teach. They went on teaching other, other NGOs. They presented at their meetings. It spread. It absolutely spread. It was amazing. It's, it's the most extraordinary thing when that happens, because you don't quite know how it's happening or who's doing it. It's just happening. We found people could step gardens. This is the image now of refugee camps we put before people and they say we can do it. So what happened? We found that when the war broke out in Ukraine and permacultures became refugees, we could give them teacher training courses. Now, in Barcelona today, Ukraine refugees are training to go back to Ukraine and teach to rebuild the country. The Afghans who came to Pakistan and were in great danger, the Portuguese government said, we'll take people with permaculture. A whole group of 10 went. Then a group of 20 went because the government liked the project in rural areas because Portugal is desperately degraded. Spanish government says, we'll take 30. They're going to go down to Islamabad and help people with their papers who are sitting in fear for all reasons in Islamabad. So what has happened? Not only did someone grow a little garden, not only did someone make a film, not only did someone teach one, but what happened was that we're changing government policy and we're going to change it here. We absolutely believe it has to happen, that we have to have people, we have to have refugee camps which are transformed and people who can learn stuff like permaculture for a future. They're learning about climate change, they're learning what they need, they're learning about economy, renewable agriculture. These are the people we want, but the camps must change. It doesn't have to be the way it is. There's no reason under the sun. This is not an expensive program. So if you know anyone who knows UNHCR, World Vision, um, Red Cross, Red Crescent, Danish Red Cross, Brock for the World, any NGO at all, and they're to do with refugees, you say to them, it doesn't have to be like this. Thank you, everyone. Oh.